Welcome to Echocardiography Lecture Series. This lecture is Mitral Valve Part 2. I'll speak about mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation mechanism is divided into primary and secondary. Whether the problem is in the mitral valve leaflets, we call it primary. If the problem is in, in the apparatus itself, for example, the LV or LA due to remodeling, then it is secondary mitral regurgitation. And the reason we have this classification because it has a great impact on therapeutic approach as well as the outcome. Another useful interventional based classification is the Carpentier classification. Carpentier classification we have uh, the type 1 where the leaflet motion is normal. So here in type 1 leaflet motion is normal but the problem for example might be annular dilatation. So this is the annulus it is dilated that we see in, in left atrial dilatation. We might have a perforation as well. So leaflet motion is still normal but there is a hole in the leaflet. In type 2 we have excessive motion, so maybe a prolapse, it will move too much, the leaflets, like in prolapse or in flail. In type 3, we have restricted motion. For example, if we have a restricted motion only in systole that we see in type 3A, and we see it, the classical example is a rheumatic mitral valve, where the valves are uh, thickened and restricted, calcified, so we see it during systole, there is a restriction, so uh, that is 3A. If we see it during systole and diastole, like in uh, LV dilatation, dilated cardiomyopathy, then it is 3B. Uh, and then you have a restriction in systole as well as in diastole. Starting with primary mitral regurgitation, we have a classical example here is myxomatous degeneration, which is a spectrum of disease that starts with fibro fibroelastic deficiency all the way to Barlow's disease. So if we have excessive motion of the mitral valve leaflets, it will be redundant, but there is no thickening. So there is a fibroelastic deficiency. If there is some thickening, as well as redundancy, then it's myxomatous degeneration. And if there is diffuse thickening and diffuse redundancy in the mitral valve, for example, there is diffuse prolapse, bileaflet prolapse, and diffuse thickening, then it is the extreme form, which is Barlow's disease. In this example, you can see uh, the mitral valve has excessive motion, but there is no much thickening of the leaflets. The leaflets appear to be thin and normal in size. Usually excessive thickening is defined as five millimeter or more. So you will see excessive motion that even will pass the level of annulus. We said the level of annulus is from insertion to insertion. So it will pass it. We will see it in still images. So if there is no much thickening, only excessive motion and redundancy of the mitral leaflets, we call it fibroelastic deficiency. In this example, where we see there is excessive motion as well as thickening of the mitral uh, leaflets. So you see excessive motion, particularly here in the posterior leaflet, it will way past the annular level and there is thickening of the mitral leaflets. Both mitral leaflets appear to be thickened. So we call it myxomatous degeneration. And this extreme form of myxomatous degeneration, we will see a diffuse thickening everywhere and redundancy of the mitral leaflets. And this is a transesophageal echo here showing that example that you will have diffuse prolapse and diffuse thickening and redundancy. So we call it Barlow's disease. Barlow's disease is 
caused by mucopolysaccharide infiltration. Typically, that will involve both leaflets and even the cords. Fibroelastic deficiency, mctermatous degeneration, up to Barlow's disease, they can present as a prolapse or even as a flail leaflet or flail segment. So mitral valve prolapse is defined by echocardiography as a displacement of the mitral leaflet into the left atrium by 2 millimeter or more. So it is 2 or more so and uh, fr from the annulus so the annulus is from insertion point all the way to the insertion point and if we drew a line so this is the annular line so in this example we have a prolapse of the anterior leaflet more than two millimeter as well as the posterior leaflet here in this example here on the right side we have prolapse of the posterior leaflet we need to keep in mind that that definition applies to long axis view. So parasternal long axis view, like in this example, or apical long axis or apical three chamber view. We cannot use the four chamber view. We cannot use the uh, two chamber view because it will Overdiagnose mitral valve prolapse because the mitral valve as well as the mitral annulus is a saddle shape and if we diagnose using or utilizing those view we will over diagnose mitral valve prolapse if we have a shift or displacement but that displacement is less than two millimeter so it, it does not qualify for a prolapse we don't call it prolapse we call it billowing a flail leaflet is an extreme form of prolapse where the edge and the body of the leaflet are located in the left atrium this is example here you if you look at the posterior mitral leaflet here you will find that the tip as well as part of the body pointing toward the left atrium and in this transesophageal echocardiography you will see it more uh, pronounced so this is the posterior leaflet it's pointing all the way to the left atrium so we call it a flail a flail is usually caused by a rupture of the cord or in more extreme cases rupture of papillary muscle and if we have only maybe the tip is pointing toward the left atrium but the body is still intact so uh, th we call it a partial flail and usually it is due to rupture of a primary cord the primary cord if you remember is the cord that attach at the edges of the mitral leaflets a mode is always helpful in diagnosing cardiac diseases in this example we can diagnose a mitral prolapse if you look this is the anterior mitral leaflet it has all that motion here is the e motion and the a and then it's all the way down to the c or the closure line and then later toward systole you will see separation here of the posterior leaflet away from the anterior leaflet coming down compared to the normal you will see the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet they come together and they stay together as a straight line sometimes you can have both of them prolapsing going down or one of them prolapsing like in this example you can see the posterior leaflet is prolapsing all the way down here into the left atrium now again if we are reporting a mitral valve disease we have to report the segment where the mitral valve disease is or the scallop so we cons we talked about the anatomy and there is p1 scallop p2 scallop and p3 scallop and each scallop has opposing segment a1 segment a2 segment and a3 segments so usually if we see the aorta or aortic valve like in this example so the cut will be something like this cutting a2 and p2 so this is an a2 the anterior leaflet which is closest to the aorta 
as in this uh, diagram and the posterior one which is away from the aorta so and it is a p2 so a2 and p2 we see it in the long axis view even in the apical long axis view or apical three chamber view again we see the aortic valve so the cut is usually in, in vertical way so this is a2 p2 another example uh, in in four chamber in four chamber view then the cut is usually something like this that like that blue line where we have p2 and then part of a1 and then part of a2 and part of a3 so this is the cut so p1 here the posterior is usually lateral away from the aorta the aorta will be somewhere here it's not shown here because it's four chamber and then when you have a P1, then of course you will have an A1 touching the P1, and then A2 and A3. And the best way to determine the pathology anatomy in which scalopor segment is actually 3D. If we look here at the 3D, we call it the surgeon's view. This view is the surgeon view, where we have the aortic valve here at the top supposed to be at 12 o'clock then if you're looking from the left atrium so we're looking from the left atrial perspective now the appendage will be somewhere here so this is lateral and we started counting from the lateral so that will be the posterior down here and the anterior is this is the anterior leaflet so anterior leaflet is the much larger one and then here we have counting from lateral toward the medial is p1 p2 and p3 and in this example we can see a flail p1 scallop and we can see the cords here are torn cord besides we can see some of the bulge which is a prolapse from the p2 if we look at apical two chamber which we call the commissural view where we cut through the commissure here from the lateral commissure all the way to the medial commissure and then we can see p1 which is here co-opting with a1 and then we can see a2 a3 and p3 so we call it commissural view and normally we can see two jets, small jets here in, in a normal mitral regurgitation. And this is a video showing the mitral valve pathology. This is a 3D and this is the aortic valve here and we're looking from the LA perspective. So this is the surgeon's view. So we have here the appendage. So the appendage is placed laterally so we have here p1 p2 and p3 scallops and the segments of a1 a2 and a3 segment and we have the problem here is at p1 there is a flail and you can see part of the cords coming similarly if you look at this image here you will see the pathology at p2 scallop If we have a flail leaflet, then the mitral regurgitation is usually severe. Uh, the direction of mitral regurgitation, jet and prolapse and flail is eccentric and opposite to the diseased leaflet. So if we have a problem of the posterior here, posterior leaflet, then we have anteriorly directed jet. So here we have the jet coming anteriorly and wraps around here here we have a problem of the posterior leaflet again and we have anteriorly directed jet short axis at the mitral level can be very helpful in this example you can see there is a prolapse here so there is no cooptation at this point there is a prolapse and 
similarly to the 3d we come from lateral to medial so p1 is here p2 scallop is here and p3 scallop is here and the corresponding segments a1 a2 and a3 are here so we can see a prolapse of the posterior leaflet at p2 scallop with significant mitral regurgitation here in rheumatic mitral valve the usual presentation is mitral stenosis however in severe cases we will get calcification of the leaflets and cords and they might be fixed so for this example this this leaflet here the posterior leaflet is fixed and then the coaptation of the anterior leaflet will will be below the posterior leaflet creating what looks like a prolapse but it's not actually a prolapse or a flail uh, and then we will have a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation another thing is cord may rupture and rheumatic degeneration and cause a flail or partially flail leaflet this is a rheumatic mitral valve you can see here if you look at the 2d image you can see thickening of the leaflet tip with the classical doming and then the posterior leaflet is fixed there is no much of mobility as well as thickened and calcified and then we have a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation so again uh, mit mitral regurgitation can occur in rheumatic disease another cause of mitral regurgitation is the mitral cleft it's a congenital disease it can be isolated or commonly associated with other diseases for example parachute mitral valve ostium primum asd and it commonly affect the anterior leaflet here and if you look at the 2d you will see there is a hole here there is a collucent space here so that is the cleft and to confirm it we add a color and then you will see a regurgitation coming from that uh, lesion so a common association also has to be looked for as we mentioned so this is the same patient with a cleft and if you look carefully here you will you will see that both leaflets and diastole they are pointing somewhere here laterally or infralaterally you'll see the anterior leaflet should open all the way but here it points a little bit to the lateral position as if it is pulled that indicates maybe there is a parachute parachute is usually having when we have a single pap muscle or if we have those pap muscle at very close distance to each other like in this example so this is a cleft mitral valve you can see even the cleft here if you look carefully and it is associated with uh, the parachute mitral valve now speaking about secondary MR secondary MR can be due to various reasons one of them is LV remodeling or LV dilatation for any reason that will include uh, ischemia or dilated cardiomyopathy mitral annular dilatation so that what we see in atrial fibrillation and dilated left atrium and ischemic mitral regurgitation in secondary MR the mitral leaflets are normal or minimally affected but are typically tethered this is example of MR secondary to LV remodeling or LV dilatation here the reason appears to be secondary to ischemia because we have a thinned akinetic infralateral wall but the whole mark here is apical tethering of the mitral leaflets so ideally the mitral leaflet should co up somewhere here near the annulus but you can see as if the both leaflets are pulled away toward the apex so we call it apical tethering of the mitral leaflet so it can be secondary to ischemia or it can be secondary to dilated cardiomyopathy where we have symmetrical 
pulling of both mitral leaflets. Occasionally, the body of the anterior leaflet will be tethered apically, pulling it away from the coaptation line, giving the seagull appearance. To differentiate that seagull appearance, what you see here, the anterior mitral leaflet is something like this, resembling the seagull wing. To differentiate it from doming secondary to mitral, uh, rheumatic mitral valve, here we don't see thickening. The hockey stick appearance, then we will have a thickened uh, mitral leaflet. But here without thickening, we have this pulling of the leaflet body by the dilated LV, then we will have the seagull appearance, which is again uh, tethering of the mitral valve, uh, which is a hallmark of functional mitral regurgitation. Functional mitral regurgitation or secondary mitral regurgitations are the same. An ischemic mitral regurgitation due to papillary muscle dysfunction which is secondary to ischemia, the postromedial papillary muscle is usual uh, is the usual culprit because it's uh, ha it has a single blood supply that causes restriction of the systolic motion of the posterior leaflet. If you look here at the posterior leaflet, you will see it not moving much, and then here we have a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. So this is an example of uh, ischemic mitral regurgitation. To know that it's ischemic mitral regurgitation due to papillary muscle dysfunction, usually we will have posterior leaflet is not moving, so it's dysfunctional, and then we will see wall motion abnormalities. This is the same patient where we can see here clearly that the infralateral wall is akinetic. So we have wall motion abnormalities, fixed posterior leaflet, and posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. So we call it ischemic mitral regurgitation, secondary to papillary muscle dysfunction. The hallmark of secondary mitral regurgitation, whether being due to LV remodeling or ischemic or not is tenting. So we can see here apically tethered leaflet, mitral leaflets, causing that which appears like a tent. So we call it tenting. And tenting height from the annulus to the coaptation point correlates with the severity of secondary MR. Similarly, we have even the tenting area, and in some advanced 3D calculation, we can calculate tenting volume, all of which correlate with the severity of secondary MR, but they are not accurate in severity grading. Another cause of mitral regurgitation is SAM, or systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet, which is when a part of the leaflet is pushed or pulled anteriorly into the LVOT. If you look at this LVOT here, you will see that the, there is a part of the anterior mitral leaflet. So LVOT will be like this, and part of the anterior mitral leaflet will come into the LVOT, causing obstruction of the LVOT and mitral regurgitation. So the posterior leaflet is held at the coaptation point, but the anterior leaflet is pulled away from the, the coaptation point, creating a gap which is posteriorly directed or oriented gap that will cause a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. We see SAM commonly in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for various reasons that will be discussed somewhere else. As usual, a mode is helpful, and if you look here, you will see the SAM. You will see that this is the anterior mitral leaflet, and during systole, it will be pulled or pushed away anteriorly, 
causing the coaptation gap. So here is the systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet. So eccentric mitral regurgitation etiology. So if it is anteriorly directed, then the only reasonable cause is a prolapse or a flail of the posterior leaflet. If it is a posteriorly directed, so then it is a prolapse or a flail of the anterior leaflet. It can be an ischemic MR and also it can be secondary to SAM. So also what I want to say is Functional MR or secondary MR can be posterior, can be central, but cannot be anterior. So always if we have a functional MR, then it is either central, depending on the leaflet tethering, or posterior. But if we have anteriorly directed jet, it is not a functional MR. And then we have to look into the, the images to find the correct pathology. And now we'll proceed with the mitral regurgitation grading. We we'll start with the color Doppler and the jet area. So the jet area is excellent in ruling out MR, but it is not reliable for MR grading. So patient with severe mitral regurgitation and low blood pressure or maybe sedated or have a decreased loading condition, they will have a small color flow jet when compared to hypertensive patient. The reason for that is that jet area here is dependent on the momentum and the momentum is the regurgitant area. So it's area times the velocity. So if the velocity increases, then we will have a high jet area with the same with the same regurgitant area. So it depends on the velocity. And the velocity, of course, will depend on the pressure difference between the LV here and the left atrium. So if we have high blood pressure, then we will have high LV pressure, and then we will have higher velocity of the mitral regurgitation, giving a bigger jet area. So again, so regurgitant jet area is dependent on the momentum, which is dependent on the velocity. That is dependent on the loading condition. Another pitfall of the jet area by color Doppler is eccentric MR. So in eccentric MR, we will have the Conada effect. The Conada effect is when there is an eccentric jet, it will attach itself to a nearby surface and remains attached. So the jet will be eccentric and then it will appear smaller than the reality. And then we will underestimate the mitral regurgitation by color Doppler. Also, the jet area is dependent on other technical factors such as the Nyquist limit. So if we lower the Nyquist limit, it will recruit a lower velocity flow into the jet area, which then will appear larger. However, when MR jet area is central and is more than 50% of the left atrium, or the MR is eccentric and wraps around, it will wrap around all the way in the left atrium and maybe enter even a pulmonary vein, then it is suggestive of a severe MR. It does not mean it is severe and we call it severe only based on that. It is only suggestive of a severe mitral regurgitation. Another parameter for grading mitral regurgitation by color Doppler is the vena contractor. So as we know, any flow has three parts, the flow conversion, then vena contracta, which is the narrowest area of the jet as it passes through the valve, and then we have the jet area. So vena contracta, we measure, it, we measure the diameter of that flow. Ideally, we should measure it in parasternal long axis so we can utilize the axial resolution. 
like in this example. We know axial resolution is better than lateral resolution. If we will do the four chamber view, and then this is the mitral valve here, and we measure the vena contracta here, so this will utilize the lateral resolution, which is suboptimal. Vena contracta has an advantage of being load independent. So it, it is independent of the flow and the driving pressure. A vena contracta of less than 0.3 centimeter is indicative of mild MR. More than 0.7 indicates severe MR. And in between, it will be moderate mitral regurgitation. Vena contracta, also we will say some of the pitfall about vena contracta, is accurate for central as well as eccentric jet. However, if we have multiple jets, we cannot add the vena contracta to, together. So if I, if I have MR here and MR here, then I measure this vena contracta and then add it to this vena contracta. It does not work that way. And instead, we can use something else. Maybe we can use the vena contracta area and then we can add them together like in the coming example that we will see. Vena contracta area is useful in multiple jet because vena contracta width only is no longer accurate and cannot be cumulatively added since there is a marked non-circular shape of the regurgitant orifice. To measure the vena contracta area, it should be done by 3D echocardiography and vena contracta area can be directly measured with a multi-planar reconstruction method. So we measure, we, we measure the vena contracta area here after aligning all the planes to pass through the vena contracta and then we trace the area and then that area if we have multiple jet we can add them together and that area correlates very well with the effective regurgitant orifice area and then we can use it as a surrogate for the effective regurgitant orifice area now proceeding with the spectral doppler and Continuous wave Doppler. Continuous wave Doppler is helpful in qualitatively assess mitral regurgitation uh, severity. In mild MR, we will see a faint jet and maybe incomplete. In moderate, it will be more dense. We compare the density with a forward flow, with that flow here. And if we have it even dense, and early peaking, so triangular, it will be triangular, early peaking, it indicates severe mitral regurgitation. Now proceeding with the pulse wave Doppler. This is the left atrium and this is the LV. As the MR severity increases, we will have increase in the pressure of the left atrium. And once the mitral valve opens during diastole, then we will have a high velocity jet or flow, early flow to the LV. So E wave here will be very high. So the velocity of E wave, if it is more than 1.2 meter per second, it indicates or suggestive of severe mitral regurgitation. But we need to remember that high LA pressure can be due to diastolic dysfunction. Now, if we have secondary MR where LV is abnormal, definitely there will be a diastolic dysfunction and that will affect this E wave velocity. But it's worth mentioning that if we have a low E wave velocity and even if the A is dominant, we have A wave that is bigger than the E, it will exclude, we don't have severe mitral regurgitation. So it will exclude severe MR. Another parameter of grading mitral valve is having a look at the pulmonary venous flow by pulse wave Doppler. 
In transthoracic echocardiography, the problem is usually we can only sample the right upper pulmonary vein. That also lies in the far field. So there is a large distance between the probe here and the pulmonary vein. That can cause a liaising problem. However, it's worth doing that technique. In normal LA pressure, we will have a systolic dominance. So we have a larger S wave than the D wave. And this will exclude severe mitral regurgitation. As the pressure in the left atrium increases, then the S wave will be smaller and then we will have systolic blunting wave or systolic blunting flow pattern of the pulmonary vein. That might indicate more significant MR. And then in severe MR, we might have the MR jet goes pass through the left atrium and into the pulmonary vein, giving us a reversal of the systolic flow here into the pulmonary vein. And if we see flow reversal in more than one pulmonary vein, particularly in transesophageal echocardiography, then that will suggest or indicate severe mitral regurgitation. And sometimes if we have eccentric jet, it will go into one pulmonary vein selectively, not the other. That clinically also can cause unilateral pulmonary edema. For example, if it goes to the right, not to the left, and this will indicate at least moderate mitral regurgitation. Another grading tool is the left atrium volume. So if MR is significant and is chronic, not acute, we expect the LA pressure to increase and causing LA volume to increase. So if we have a normal LA size, it will definitely exclude chronic severe MR. It will not exclude acute severe MR, but it will exclude a chronic severe MR. Similarly, the LV. LV will dilate due to volume overload secondary to the MR. So a normal size LV also will exclude a chronic severe mitral regurgitation. As usual, the best way for grading a valve disease is quantification. And nothing is better than quantification to be 100% sure before sending this patient for intervention. In MR quantification, we measure or calculate regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction as well as the effective regurgitant orifice area. So those are parameters of quantification. Another good method for quantification of mitral regurgitation is the PISA method. For details of PISA and how to do it, you can refer to the hemodynamic lecture. But we need to keep few pitfalls during utilizing the PISA method. One of them is, this is the left atrium and this is the LV. One of them is having eccentric MR. So if we are having eccentric MR, then aligning our CW beam to the MR might be difficult. So you cannot align it to the MR jet. And that will give us some errors in the spectral Doppler or CW Doppler of the mitral regurgitation. So we need to keep that in mind. Another pitfall, we see it commonly in mitral valve prolapse. So we need to understand that mitral valve prolapse will cause regurgitation toward the end of systole. So early systole here, we have no regurgitation. But for a short period of time toward the end of systole, we will have regurgitation with a larger effective regurgitant orifice area. But because the, the duration is small, the volume that escapes through that area is small. So we will have a high effective regurgitant orifice area, 
but a small regurgitant volume. And because the path pathophysiology and the clinical presentation of mitral regurgitation and the clinical consequence on the LA and LV is dependent on the regurgitant volume, not the effective regurgitant orifice area. Therefore, the regurgitant volume here has more priority and we will depend on it in grading the mitral regurgitation. Another pitfall of PISA is in functional MR. So in functional MR, usually the PISA or the, the area is not circular. The vena contracta area is not circular. Usually it is more of oval shape. So if we, if we cut this jet, if we assume there is a jet here and we cut it, it will be oval. But the PISA method will assume a circular and based on that, our calculation is based on circular effective regression and orifice area. But usually in secondary or functional MR, it is not circular. We can then use the uh, vena contracta area utilizing 3D method. If you see there is a difference in the vena contracta, let's, let's say you checked in four chamber view, four chamber, and you measure the vena contracta and then you do a two chamber view and then you measure the vena contracta so this is four chamber and this is two chamber and there is a big difference between the four chamber and the two chamber that will indicate that the effective regurgitant orifice area is not circular and maybe PISA is not accurate and we have to do something else we can also quantify using the volumetric method Volumetric method, when performed accurately, it eliminates the PISA limitation because now we have the effective regurgitant orifice area is derived from the regurgitant volume. So first we calculate the regurgitant volume and based on that regurgitant volume, we will get the average effective regurgitant orifice area. And how to do that? It is mentioned in details in the hemodynamic lecture, but for a quick recall, we measure the annular diameter here, and then we put our pulse wave Doppler in the mitral annulus here. So we measure that area, we calculate the area assuming a circle, which is pi r square, and then we trace the VTI here, and then we multiply it. And based on continuity equation and calculating the volume that is leaving the LVOT, so for example, if 100 ml comes from the mitral valve to the LV, but only 60 ml leaves the LVOT, then the difference is 40. And that 40 must have regurged back to the left atrium during systole. So the regurgitant volume here is 40 ml. And from that, we can also estimate the effective regurgitant orifice area. So MR should be quantified in a comprehensive approach putting all variables together to reach an accurate grading it is always more accurate to quantify the regurgitation however in 2017 the american society of echocardiography came with the guidelines that says if you have specific criteria four or more for mild it is then mild if you have four or more of the specific criteria for severe then it is severe. And those specific criteria for mild include small narrow jet, vena contracta less than 0.3 or equal to that, PISA radius of equal or less than 0.3, mitral inflow A dominance, so the A wave is larger than the E wave, or if we have a soft incomplete jet by CW Doppler and normal LV and LA size. 
So those are the criteria for mild. And if we have four and more, it is considered mild. And similarly for the severe, if we have a flail leaflet, it is a criteria for severe. Vena contracta equal or more than 0 0.7. Pisa radius more than one centimeter or equal to one centimeter. Area jet more than 50% of the LA is considered severe. If we have a flow reversal and pulmonary uh, veins, enlarged LV with normal LV function. So if we have four or more of that specific criteria, then it is severe without the need of quantification however if we don't fulfill the criteria then we need to quantify and again if we quantify effective regurgitant orifice area it's considered severe MR if it is 0 0.4 and more 0 0.2 or less than 0 0.2 is mild in between will be moderate regurgitant volume 30 ml less than 30 ml is mild, 60 and more is severe, in between will be moderate. Regurgitant fraction, so less than 30% is mild, equal or more than 50% of the total stroke volume is considered severe, in between is considered moderate. A word about acute mitral regurgitation. Acute MR is rare but has a significant hemodynamic compromise. Etiology is usual uh, secondary to rupture cord with a flail leaflet or rupture papillary muscle. Sometimes we can see also leaflet destruction by endocarditis. JIT is usually eccentric and the patient present with pulmonary edema and hypotension, occasionally due to that the flow being eccentric, the jet will selectively enter one of the pulmonary veins and the patient will have a unilateral pulmonary edema. If you look here carefully, the problem is in transthoracic echocardiography, we will not see much of the regurgitant jet. And this is because we, we have quick equilibrium between the left atrium. There is no enough time for the left atrium to dilate or to have LA remodeling. So we will have a quick equilibrium between the LV and LA during systole. So we will have a brief MR with small velocity. So if you look by CW Doppler, you will see small velocity MR and it, it is very brief. Usually MR, as we said, is eccentric and you can see here the papillary muscle head is in the left atrium. So, and this is secondary to papillary muscle rupture. And now because the LV is contracting not only against the aorta or aortic valve, now we have a, which is the mitral valve. So now the LV is pumping blood through the aortic valve and through the mitral valve. So the, the resistance now has decreased because now we have two holes instead of one hole. So afterload is decreased. And when you decrease afterload, you will have a good contractility. The contractility will increase. So if we have hypercontractile LV with that clinical scenario of hypotension and pulmonary edema, and then you measure stroke volume, and you find that stroke volume through LVAOT is low, then think of acute mitral regurgitation and proceed with the transesophageal echocardiography for confirmation. Thank you for watching. The next topic will be about the echocardiographic artifact.